Wonderful. So thank you so much for, for this kind invitation today. I'm very honored to be uh, attending this meeting and with, with my colleagues, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. So I, I will take this opportunity today to talk, uh, to focus a little bit on disparities in the use of uh, cardioprotective medication for type 2 diabetes. So we are transitioning a little bit from di diabetes prevention, which we have been focusing so far, to uh, some of the aspects to consider once a patient is diagnosed with diabetes and to try to, I would say, optimize as much as we can the care of these patients. So I've listed here my disclosures. This is the, uh, the roadmap for today's discussion. So I will uh, uh, provide a, a quick overview on the recent advancements uh, for diabetes type 2 uh, in terms of pharmacotherapy. Um, these are very meaningful because they prompted rapid changes in, in treatment guidelines for this condition. I will also uh, briefly introduce the concept of pharmacoequity and its role in uh, narrowing the existing health disparities. So uh, a little bit uh, touching on that too. And then I will uh, uh, share the, um, I would say, our experience and uh, in, uh, in our work um, related to the assessment of the use of novel diabetes medications uh, in, in people with heart disease and obviously type 2 diabetes. Uh, we particularly focus on uh, the uh, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities uh, to access these medications. Okay, so uh, the pharmacological innovation in diabetes has been very rapid, as you can see, uh, in the last, in particular, 15 years. Uh, several classes of glu glucose lowering medications are, have entered the market in this, in this past uh, 15, 15 years or so. Uh, we see some of the major ones here, the BP4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLT1 receptor agonists, and also the very uh, novel and new uh, group of GIP, GLT1 receptor agonists. Some of these agents, and we will focus in particular on SGLT2 inhibitors and GLT1 receptor agonists today, uh, have drastically changed the therapeutic landscape of the treatment for diabetes type 2. So a little bit of um, a, a brief overview on, on the existing evidence from RCT. So in recent placebo-controlled cardiovascular outcome trials, as we see here, this is a meta-analysis coming, point estimates coming from several meta-analyses actually, um, we see the SGLT2 inhibitors have shown beneficial effects in reducing the risk of several cardiorenal outcomes. So we see not only major adverse cardiovascular events, we see a decrease in risk and also of its components, but also uh, hospitalization for heart failure. We see beneficial effects with respect to kidney outcomes as well as all-cause mortality. Similarly, um, also for GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, the evidence from uh, placebo-controlled cardiovascular outcome trials point towards similar reductions in uh, major adverse uh, um, cardiovascular events, as well as similar uh, cardiorenal outcomes as previously discussed for SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, prompted by this uh, very strong accumulating evidence, there has been really a shift in the treatment paradigm of diabetes type 2. So up to 2017, at least uh, for, for the US, um, the ADA guidelines pretty equally recommended a variety of second line options to control uh, um, glucose in, in patients with type 2 diabetes in addition to metformin without any really strong consideration for the individual cardiorenal risk. Since 2018, however, uh, fueled by these cardiovascular benefits demonstrated in, by these randomized control trials, guidelines have recommended the preferential use of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists in patients with type 2 diabetes and either atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or failure or chronic kidney disease. There is also some I want now to take a step back and uh, one, I think it's important at this point to introduce uh, the concept of pharmacoequity. This is uh, a, a field that is advanced uh, um, by uh, Dr. Essien, and we see here a very uh, well-written well viewpoint by him 
uh, Fabri Finjame a couple of years ago, uh, where uh, he outlines very clearly what are the goals of pharmacoequity are, and specifically ensuring that all individuals, uh, regardless of race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or availability of resources, have access to the highest quality medications required to manage their health needs. So in uh, um, this goal, as we, as, as, as we will discuss a little bit later on, is of a tremendous importance in order to address the existing health disparities in diabetes, given in particular the critical and growing role of prescription medications in the management of diabetes and also other chronic diseases. So it has been shown that uh, racial and ethnic minority population disproportionately experience higher prevalence and greater severity of chronic diseases. But the same populations are also more likely to have insufficient insurance or complete lack of insurance in the United States and often report the highest rates of cost-related delays in care and lower access to high-quality medication therapy. For example, um, uh, disparities have been reported in, uh, we see a couple of examples from, from a couple of studies in the use of novel medications and guideline concordant care in people with cardiovascular disease. So we see, for example, a study, a recent study examined the use of different oral anticoagulants for people with atrial fibrillation and found that um, Black and Hispanic individuals were less likely to use novel uh, direct acting oral anticoagulants and instead very much, um, very much more likely to, to use a warfarin, uh, an older uh, treatment for atrial fibrillation, uh, or no or, or anticoagulation at all. Similarly, another study uh, which focused on a large cohort of people with heart failure found that uh, Hispanic individuals were less likely to use uh, several key heart failure medications. We see, it, for example, ARNI, uh, mineral corticoids, receptor agonist here, but also they were less likely to achieve a target dose of um, many other important cardiovascular um, medications and uh, treatments, such as, for example, beta blockers. So with these examples in mind, um, we uh, decided to conduct a study, and you probably you recognize some, some names in, in, this, in these publications uh, from today's panelists, uh, so we sought to examine the current patterns of use of, FG, of GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors among a court of older adults with diabetes type 2 and incident cardiovascular disease. Uh, we wanted to, in particular, focus on the um, potential racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in the access to these medications. So in order to conduct this study, we use data from Medicare fee-for-service between 2016 and 2019 in the United States. So Medicare is a US nationwide uh, claims database of federally insured Americans, 16, uh, 65 years old and older uh, mostly, uh, which includes information about uh, um, di diagnostic codes uh, recorded during physician visits, hospital admissions, but also very detailed information with respect to medication fills. So our study population included older adults with type 2 diabetes who develop a new indication for GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors use in the form of an incident atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease of heart failure. This was really our court entry day zero. Uh, we uh, consider the information during the, the year prior to this court entry, so we excluded patients that had previously been exposed to either SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists. We also excluded patients with kidney failure, with some history of kidney fail failure at any point uh, during uh, the, 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 the year before to court entry. And the ultimate goal of this population was really try to identify a subset of, of the um, US population for whom either uh, SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists would, would be universally recommended based on current guidelines and without having, I would say, uh, very strong contraindications, such as, for example, kidney failure that would prevent the use in particular of SGLT2 inhibitors. Sorry. So 
So uh, our exposures of interest were race, ethnicity in particular, and zip code level social deprivation index. Uh, the, we uh, assessed uh, several covariates uh, that we uh, again measured during the uh, 365 days before court entry. The, those included demographics, including age, sex, region, year, comorbidities, so both uh, metabolic, cardiovascular, claims-based frailty and comorbidity index. So, so those are uh, indices that we use based on information collected in claims to measure a uh, burden of comorbidities in our, and frailty in our population. We included information on other medication use as well as healthcare utilization measures, for example, um, physician visits, uh, previous hospitalizations and so forth. So the outcome of interest was uh, to have received at least one field prescription for either GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT-2 during, as we see here, the 180 days of court um, of follow-up after court entry. Uh, we, during this period, we calculated incidence rates for medication initiation for GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors, and we fit Cox proportional hazards model with the idea of trying to um, quantify the association between race, ethnicity, and social deprivation index with the initiation of either one of these, of these treatments. So we see that after having applied this inclusion and exclusion criteria, we identified over 4 million individuals uh, who entered our uh, court. Um, this, uh, this population had a mean um, age of approximately 75, 76 years. 51% um, approximately of individuals were women and approximately 80% were non-Hispanic white. Before adjustment, we, um, uh, we, we, we observed that novel medication initiators were uh, overall younger and more likely to be men um, compared to non-initiators of either SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonists. They were also more li less likely to, uh, to be Black or African-American. One striking aspect, and I'm going to touch on that also in the next slide, but um, as a starting point, uh, it's, it was that for a population for whom guidelines would, I was, as, we, as we discussed, universally recommend these therapies, only 1.7% of individuals initiated either an SGLT2 or a GLP-1 receptor agonist during the follow-up. So we did notice, though, that there was increase in the use of SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists during the study period. We see that between 2016 and 2019, uh, they, they use um, almost doubled, I would say. But as previously noted, this was in the context of so a very low rate of initiation overall. So after adjustment for uh, the several comorbidities, sorry, covariates that we have uh, um, we measured before uh, court entry, so including demographic characteristics, comorbidities, medication use, and healthcare utilization measures, we found that people who were older or female had a lower likelihood of initiating a novel therapy uh, with SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonist as well as Black individuals and those of other race ethnicity. We also found there was a small but significant association between living in an area of higher socioeconomic deprivation in the US and lower rates of medication use. Uh, there were multiple medical factors uh, that we uh, explore and were associated with increased or decreased probability of receiving these agents. So, so for example, we see that uh, cardiovascular risk factor indicative of early disease, for example, hypertension, nephrodia, obesity uh, in general, were associated with increased probability of receiving novel treatments. Whereas we found that markers of the more advanced type of uh, disease and disease severity were um, on, on the opposite associated with decreased probability of initiation. We also found a prior filling of medications used for treatment of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and heart failure, including beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, for example was associated with higher rates and uh, higher probability of receiving GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors, 
Whereas a filling other first line antihypertensive agents, for example, more commonly used for, um, I would say, uncomplicated hypertension, and so not uh, really um, per guideline in this population, were associated with less likelihood of receiving these novel treatments. Again, we found that the diabetes microvascular complications and the use of additional um, diabetes medications were associated with increased likelihood for receiving these novel agents. And finally, in terms of LK utilization, we found that uh, to receive care by a specialist uh, increased the likelihood of, again, receiving novel treatment, whereas instead having a recent history of an emergency room visit or hospital admissions uh, was decreasing the likelihood of uh, receiving these novel agents. We uh, perform a few subgroup analysis. Here we see results in analysis stratified by indication. So specifically, we uh, divided the population by uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease indication and heart failure. We found um, as a starting point that the incidence rate of for initiation of these novel agents was higher among patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease compared to patients with uh, heart failure, a baseline. We also found that overall, um, uh, racial, the racial and ethnic and socioeconomic disparities we observed in the primary analysis persisted also in this stratified analysis. In analysis stratified by year, uh, we again uh, confirmed that racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities also persisted for all years of study from 2016 to 2019. Um, with some uh, evidence of a decreasing trend in the degree of disparity over time among non-Hispanic Black and other race individuals. So these findings uh, have been um, replicated in several studies at this point in time based on claims registered in each EHR uh, conducted in the United States as well in Europe mostly. These studies have confirmed the low rate in overall of, for the use of this novel treatment, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP1 receptor agonists, as well as the presence of differences in, in the access to these agents for racial and ethnic minorities and for individuals with socioeconomic deprivation uh, with and without cardiovascular indications. Some of these studies have also confirmed that individuals with cardiorenal indications who we would expect would be the ones that would receive the greatest benefit in being treated with these agents, are generally less likely to receive therapy with these novel agents. So along these lines, a study wanted to quantify the consequences of missed treatment with a GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors, and wanted to specifically estimate the number of preventable MACE events, so major adverse cardiovascular event outcomes, if all patients, uh, hypothetical, uh, hypothetically, uh, were treated with guideline-directed care with respect to three medication uh, of classes of interest, let's say. So they focus on high-intensity statins, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and GLP-1 receptor agonists, or SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, as we see here, the, the authors used the information from over 150,000 commercial insured adults with type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And we see that they found that only 2.7% of the treated individuals, uh, so of the individuals included in the, in the study, were really treated with all three of these, uh, um, I would say, treatments that the authors wanted to assess. And among the three uh, treatments, they found that GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors therapy was the most underused of, of, of the three, and therefore had the greatest potential for absolute risk reduction over three years. The author specifically quantified this uh, potential for risk reduction as the potential of, um, I would say, preventing uh, up to 2,200 MACE events had this patient been treated with these agents 100% for 100% over a three-year period. So in conclusion, so we see that there are significant racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in the use of diabetes medications with proven cardiovascular benefits. 
And this is true also in populations with strong indications for treatment with these agents. Uh, because of the established benefits uh, from RCTs of these uh, classes of medications, these disparities used will translate into disparities in clinical outcomes. And we have seen some um, attempt for quantification in this regard uh, based on the, on the uh, study I've just discussed. It is exactly in this context that improving pharmacoequity equity can represent a meaningful step towards decreasing health disparities. So with this, I thank you everyone for the, the kind attention and a spe special acknowledgement to my co-investigator in particular, to Dr. Sarah Cromer, who led this work and who is also one of our panelists today. So thank you so much, um, everyone. I'm very happy to answer questions. <laughs>